I'm Ulf. Uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder for Enchflow. And um, I was asked to talk about Basel rules and how to write them. Now, <coughs> I realized that there are maybe a very mixed audience here. So I know some of you are already rules experts. Um, some of you may be beginners. And so I have started to prepare the talk. But then when I realized that, I was like, OK, what are we going to do for advanced topics? And so the plan is, somewhere halfway through the talk, I have a slide where you get to choose what you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and we will figure out how that works. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I mean, why, why should you listen to me at all? Um, For, for those who don't recognize this, this is a GitHub page for Bazel. Um, and this is the, the contributors sorted by number of contributions. Um, I'm not in first place anymore. So how many of those are copybar? How many of those <laughs> how many of those are automated? Not a single one of them is automated. I wrote all of these myself. So uh, yeah, I spent um, a little bit of time on Bazel. Um, I worked at Google for a while. So I know a thing or two. Um, so hopefully I can answer all of your Bazel rules questions. Um, but if I can't, I know there are rules experts here. So hopefully you can help me out with, with the things that I don't know. All right. Uh, that was uh, not updated. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wanted to go back to update this after preparing the talk, and apparently I forgot. That. That's very embarrassing. I'm sorry? Is this a metaphor for an incremental build system? Yes. <laughs> All right, so the contents of this talk. What I'm going to talk about is the basic rules model. So if you want to write a rule for Bazel, whether it's built into Bazel or in Starlark, this is the model that rule, rules follow. I'm going to have some snippets of Starlark on a few pages, so you can know what that looks like in practice. Um, for the details on exactly how to write the Starlark code, I recommend looking at the documentation. The low-level documentation is pretty good. The high-level documentation could do with some improvements. Sorry about that. So when we talk about Bazel, this is sort of, this looks wrong, I know. But bear with me. I, this, is, this is exactly what I wanted on this slide. Um, so this is, I, I assume that you have at least, a, so no, you know what Bazel is. I'm not going to talk about what Bazel is or go into details why it exists in the first place. I'm happy to do that afterwards. I've already been asked today before uh, why Basil at all. And it's a, it's a fascinating discussion which I'm happy to have after I had a few beers. Um, and I also assume that you've seen a build file before, right? You know that you can write some things in a build file and then that you know tells Basil what to do about it. Um, if you don't know that, I will not be angry if any of you want to leave. That's fine. Um, this might be a little bit much if you're a complete beginner. Um, and, and also, I want to make this interactive. If you have questions, if I'm going too fast, if I'm going too slow, uh, if you have questions, please let me know. I'm happy to go into more details on any, on any, of, any of the things. So let's take a look at an example uh, of a simple rule in a build file. So this is a gen rule. A gen rule is basically a shell command. Um, Bazel was written primarily for the Linux platform because for many, many years, Google was only doing Linux. Um, in fact, they, at some point, they had a policy that no one was allowed to have a Windows laptop. Um, that didn't sit well with the sales team. But the, the engineers were happy with it. Um, and so this is a gen rule, and the gen rule, or any rule in Bazel, has a name. Uh, in this case, the name is generate file. 
this gen will also has two source files, a.txt and b.txt, and what it does is that it takes both source files and concatenates them into an output, output file called file.txt. Very exciting. Um, and there is a very special thing about rules in Bazel, which is they have a name. They must have a name. Every rule must have a name. Um, and then rules can have a number of other attributes. And if you write your own rules, you can define what these attributes are supposed to be, what types they should have, uh, what constraints should be on the values that are allowed to pass there. You know, you can have Boolean flag attributes. You can have string attributes. Um, now, if you look at this, you might think that a.txt, this line here with the quotes, that that is a string. And you would be wrong. This is not a string. To Bazel, this is a label. And a label um, constitutes a dependency. So Bazel uses labels to say that there is dependency between something and some other thing. In this case, this rule and this file. Um, on the other hand, the cat line down here, that is a string. So sometimes, sometimes the typing and what you see in the build file don't quite line up. And so when you start to write these rules, I very much encourage you to look through the documentation of sort of what types at your attributes can have and what the semantics are. So you can also have other things than rules in a build file. You can also have function calls and you can have macro calls. So um, can anyone tell me which of these is a rule invocation which of these is a macro invocation? And which of these is a function call? Well, you can't, unfortunately, <laughs> because they all have exactly the same syntax. Um, but we use this terminology not because they look different in the build file, but because to Bazel, these are different things. So to Bazel, a function is something that is called while evaluating a build file. So while Bazel is reading the build file, you can call functions. You can pass parameters, and the functions can do something with the parameters and give you a return value. Um, then some functions call rules. And when the function does that, we call it a macro. So a macro is not just something where you, you, know, you call something, you get something back. But a macro is something that calls a rule internally and basically causes that rule to come into existence in Bazel, right? Um, rules are different from functions and macros in that they have a very special, unique evaluation model. When you call a rule, um, it does something special. It creates a node inside of Bazel that represents that rule. And so every such node has a name, and you can find out what of the, which rules are in a build file. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And again, everything looks the same, but, and all of, this, of these are, are written in Starlog, but rules are special, and that's what we're looking at today. So I said Starlark, and you may not have heard that term. You may have heard it. You may not have heard it. What is Starlark? Let's talk about that briefly. Starlark is an imperative language. This may be a little bit confusing, because build files look declarative, but they are actually imperative. When Bazel reads or executes a build file, it executes it as an imperative program. It goes, starts at the top and executes things from top to bottom. Um, now, that means there is no, well, that, that means technically Bazel can see the order of things in the build file. But after the build file evaluated, the nodes, the rule nodes in the build file, they're special. Um, and you can depend, you can have labels that refer to things that come after you in the build file. There isn't really any order dependencies between the rules. Except in a corner case, but We'll not talk about that today because that's an advanced topic. So, <laughs> yeah. so Starlog is like Python. Um, the syntax is 
basically Python. It may be a mix of 2.7 and 3, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not my fault. Um, it, has, it, it is not Python, though. Um, it is simpler than Python. Uh, it has a, a simplified, a limited form of imports. It doesn't have Python imports. But, but what's more important is uh, Starlog programs cannot access hardware, or they can and they cannot access the file system. Starlog is designed to be run in a sandbox with very limited access to anything outside of the sandbox. This is how Bazel makes sure that you can't just look at a file and then behave differently whether the file exists or not or whether, you know, what contents the file has. Um, now, there are some limited ways in which Starla can access files and can, can have that interaction with the file system. I mean, it's a build system. Of course, it has to handle files, um, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, another important aspect of, of, of Starlock is it's completely deterministic. And not just, um, you know, every time you execute it, 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 it's not just deterministic on a single machine, it's deterministic across machines. Regardless of what your underlying machine is, ARM, x86, I don't know, an iPad, if you can run Bazel on that, Starlock should result, the Starlock execution should always result in exactly the same output, right? And part of that is that there, all the data types are deterministic. So, for example, map iteration in Starlock will always give you the same iteration order. And this is guaranteed by the specification. Another side note is it doesn't have any floating point types. Um, now, unfortunately, I know more about floating point numbers than, than I would really like to. Um, it is possible to, to do floating point numbers in a completely deterministic way. This may be surprising because oftentimes in computer science, we talk about floating point numbers and we say, oh, it's not you know, exact and whatnot. Floating point numbers are actually exactly specified. There is a IEEE standard about that. Uh, most of the operations on floating point numbers are exactly specified and have very precise semantics. However, those semantics lead to slow floating point implementations. And so a lot of floating point implementations do like tricks or hacks where they use like longer intermediate representation. Anyway, I'm going way too deep here. Um, I expect that at some point we'll add floating point types um, because floating point numbers can be really useful, right? Sometimes you need a percent number or a number with decimal dot. Um, but at this time, Starlock doesn't have floating point types. Um, there is another thing about Starlock, which is it is multi-threaded. But it's multi-threaded in a very specific way. There is no shared writable memory in Starlock. You cannot, Starlock threads cannot interact with each other except by reading shared memory. So there, there is shared memory that is read only and multiple Starlock threads can read the same memory. And this is sort of a different from Python where anything is mutable. Uh, in Starlock, once a, a Starlock program, like a build file has completed, all of the data structures generated by that Starlock file are frozen, are made immutable. And so after that, they can be shared between any number of threads. There is also a weird thing, which I want to mention because people stumble over it, which is there is no set type in Starlock. Um, there is a depth set type, but it's not a set. Do not mistake it for a set. If you need to do a set, if you need to have a set type or a set operations, there is a standard library extension. Um, what's it called? Starlib or something? Um, Skylib. Um, right. Sorry, the naming is a bit confusing. <laughs> Originally, Starlark was called Skylark, but then the Google trademark office said, sorry, you can't call it Skylark because there is already Skylark out there. You have to call it something else. And then eventually the team settled on Starlark. And so there is still Sky in some of these things, and in others there is not. So it's a little bit confusing. Sorry about that. Not my fault. <laughs> So when you need a set in Starlark, um, you can use either that library, uh, Skylib, or you can emulate sets by using a map. 
So the keys in a map are it's basically a set, a key set, and you don't set any values or you set them to like a, you know, whatever, a throwaway value. And then you can use that as a set. It's a little bit awkward, and I expect at some point there will be a set type in Starlark. Um, but there is this depth set type, and it's really important. I'll, I may or may not get to that depending on what you guys want to talk about. So there is a face model for rules evaluation. Um, and I want to bring up this, this, this famous quote here. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, this model is useful, but it's not actually how Basel works internally. So what's the model? The model is the loading analysis execution model for Starlark, rules, for rules. This is not Starlark itself. This is for rules specifically. Um, and the way that Basil does this is at first conceptually, right? Conceptually, Basil will go and read all of the build files, will execute all of the Starlark code. Well, maybe not all of them, but maybe just the ones that are needed for this particular build. Um, and there, you can't have access to dependencies in this phase. Um, so the Starlark code cannot see anything outside of its build file. It is possible for Starlark code to load other Starlark files. And so that way, you can have shared information between different build files. But you cannot read another build file directly. Um, during the loading phase, you can also list files on the file system with the glob function. So the glob function is handled specially uh, during Starlog evaluation. Then we get to the analysis phase. Uh, during the analysis phase, we evaluate the rule implementation. And this phase is bottom up. So Basil will first look for rules that do not have any dependencies or only dependencies on files and we'll evaluate those, and then it will evaluate the next layer above that, and then the next layer above that, all the way up to the top. So during this phase, Basil will prevent or disallow having circular dependencies between rules. You cannot have a rule depend on another rule, depend on the first rule. When you do that, you'll get an error message. This doesn't happen during loading. Loading is fine with that. Analysis will not work. And it will break before your code even gets to execute. So if you write a custom rule, the custom rule does not get to execute if there is a circular dependency. And then what can the rules do during analysis? They can create actions. So what's an action? An action is basically a command line, a list of input files, or a depth set of input files, a depth set of output files, a technically a list, I, it doesn't really matter for output files, um, a, a set of environment variables, and if you want to support remote execution, you may also have a set of remote execution key value pairs. Kind of like environment variables, but they're not available to the action. They are sent to the remote execution service, and that can do things with that, um, whatever it likes, technically. Uh, even ignore them. Uh, but that's one of the things that rules can put on their actions to, to, to message information to the remote execution service. And then after the analysis phase, after all the rules are analyzed, we get to the execution phase where Basil will execute the actions. And so the actions also form a graph, and the action graph must also be uh, non-circular. There can't be any circularity in the action graph. And that's not possible by construction. No, that's not right. You can construct the circular action graph, but Basil will give an error in that case. Yes. Has anyone seen that error before? No? Maybe? OK. So loading is written in Starlog. All the build files are Starlog. Then the rules, some of the rules can be in Starlog. Some of the rules can be built into Basil. Actions cannot currently be written in, in Starlog. Um, I expect that that will happen at some point. I, I would like that to happen at some point. So um, why? 
why do I would like what I like that to happen. Uh, Starlog is a, a platform independent language that is deterministic and that has these sandbox properties. And so in some cases you want to do something simple uh, like copy a file from A to B and maybe you know do a little bit of processing on the file. Um, and right now, how do you do that? Right now, well, you can write a shell command. Okay. Now, what do you do on Windows? Install Linux. <laughs> yeah, I, you could install Linux. That's an option. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of us have software that has to compile on Windows. Um, you can install a Linux shell on Windows. There is Bash for Windows. That's an option. Um, but oftentimes you will you'll sort of fall back to something else. So different projects have different policies around that. For example, the Chrome project uh, requires that all of the low-level things are implemented in Python. And so the build system only has to make sure that there is a Python interpreter on every platform. And then you write some Python and then you get everything. Uh, and you're basically not allowed to write like simple things in, in, in shell script. Um, and so that's an option, right? Uh, and Bazel could do that. I think it would be nice to allow Starlock to do that, um, but we'll see. So let's go a little bit more into the analysis phase to, to hopefully get a better understanding of what happens during the analysis phase. Um, so as I said, it's bottom up. There are dependencies between these rules. Uh, so if you consider your own rule, right? This is your rule. You wrote the code. Your code executes right now. That implies that Bazel, before you get to co be before your code gets to run, Bazel has already evaluated all of the dependencies, all of the rules that your rule depends on, right? And I mentioned labels earlier, right? Sometimes strings and build files are actually labels. All labels imply a dependency relationship. And so Bazel will look at all of those labels and find all of the corresponding rules and files and whatnot and make sure they're done before you get to run. And then your code runs. And then at the end of your rule evaluation, you get to decide what information to pass up to rules that depend on you. Right? The rules up here, the red ones, they haven't started yet. They have to wait until you're done. They, there's, there's code there, but the code doesn't get to run until you're done. Bazel will make sure that that is how it works. And you get to decide what information you pass up. You cannot access just about anything from your dependencies. You can only, dep you can only access things that, that the rules have made available to you. Now, if, if you depend on a file, well, you can tell that it's a file. You can inspect information about that file, but if it's a rule, you can only access some of the information that the rule has intentionally published about itself. And the way this publishing works is by providers. Um, and so a provider is basically an object that has information in it. Uh, it's typically a, a struct-like thing where you can have keys and you can have values and you can define this yourself. Um, well, every rule author can define the providers that they want to propagate upwards. Um, but of course, if you have multiple rules and they need to interact with each other, right? You have a Kotlin rule that depends on a Java rule, then they have to agree on a provider and on the semantics of that provider, right? So for Java or Java, JVM languages, that that provider could have a class pass in it, right? Um, and then you can use the class pass to compile the Kotlin code or the Java code or the Scala code. Um, and the, provi the provider definition, like the struct that, that this provider is, um, provides a way for rules to interoperate. Does that all make sense? I see nodding. That's good. So why? Why this weird model? Why do we separate loading and analysis and execution in Bazel? So the simple answer is we do that because, uh, well, that's how Bazel was implemented when I joined the project in 2009. So <laughs> that's easy. 
Um, but there are reasons why the original authors of Basel decided on this phase separation. Um, so if you look at Google circa 2009, um, they had a monorepo, but the monorepo was so large that you couldn't check out the entire monorepo on a single machine. The monorepo was larger than the largest hard disk that you could get. Right? Even just the head, real, the head commit, the latest commit on the monorepo is larger than your hard disk. So you cannot check it out. It's impossible. And so the way Google worked is that you checked out the files that you wanted to modify, and then for everything else, you used a network file system. So they wrote their own, of course, because it's Google, um, and they called it SourceFS. And so Bazel has a mechanism called package pass, where you can say, we overlay these directory trees. And so one of them comes from SourceFS. The other one is your checked out tree. And then your checked out tree, you can modify that. And the rest comes from the, from the network file system. Now, the problem with that for a build system is that if you're on a network file system and your round trip time is 100 milliseconds, that means every time you try to access a file, it takes 100 milliseconds in the worst case. Of course, you do caching locally and all of that stuff. But if it's cold, you may have to wait. So how do you, how do you, what do you do, right? Build system still has to work and you want it to be fast. So what do you do? You multi-thread, right? You basically, you, you, you throw as many requests in, as, as possible in parallel at the file system so it can fetch as much as possible in 100 milliseconds, and then you start processing that. And unfortunately, in some cases, when developers are, I don't know, um, Australia maybe, uh, the round trip time to the next data center is actually not 100 milliseconds, but 1,000 milliseconds. And I can tell you, we had to fix a lot of issues in order to make that work. And so the build files are all independent and can be read independently and evaluated independently. You don't have to wait for something else before you can execute the build file. And so that's where the loading phase is coming from. Um, and this also has some advantages that you get afterwards. So after the loading phase, you, you have your nodes, your rule nodes in every build file. And then you can look at this graph of nodes and you can perform query operations over that. So Bazel has a query function that allows you to query that graph. Um, and <laughs> unfortunately, the, the, the query language already existed when I joined there. Um, unfortunately, there isn't, at the time, there wasn't really a good graph querying language. And so this is something that one of the original authors of Bazel Alan Donovan invented this language for, for querying graph structures. Um, what's interesting about this is this query language supports cycles. Um, it's, it just works even if you have cycles in your nodes. Um, and Bazel will happily give you results in that case as well. Uh, it's just when we get to the analysis phase, you can't have cycles at that point. And if you happen to have cycles before that, uh, well, the analysis phase will throw up and uh, not continue. It will give you an error message. Now, some people have argued in the past. So, so that's basically query, and it can query the build graph or the loading phase graph. Um, and then at a later point in time, the Bazel team decided, well, what about the analysis phase graph? Maybe we want to query that as well. And it's a really good point. We do want to be able to query that, right? There are problems that you can't solve just looking at the loading phase graph, right? The loading phase graph doesn't tell you about platforms or, you know, I haven't gotten to that yet, so I don't want to explain it right now. But there are things you can't do on the loading phase graph. Trust me about that. Um, and so the Bazel team added a, a C query function that can query the analysis phase graph, which is more more precise. It gives you more precise information about what Bazel will actually do. 
Now people have suggested, why do we need Bayesian query anymore? We can have the more exact C query. And that's a really good point, but when, they, when someone asks me, I remind them, well, if you do want to do C query, that means you have to do the analysis phase. And the analysis phase is not free. So you get more exact information, but at the cost of spending more time to get it. Right? If you can solve a problem with Bayesian query, you'll have a better performance experience than if you have to go to C query. The other thing is C query, the analysis phase is platform dependent, right? It can differ depending on whether you build for Windows or Linux or Mac OS. Um, and so when you query on that graph, you have to decide which platform graph you query on. You can't query over all of them, right? So the, the, the loading phase query gives you sort of the abstract graph, which is platform independent, um, and then the analysis phase query gives you the, the graph that is platform dependent. All right, so that's loading and analysis. And actually, when I joined the team <laughs> again in 2009, the analysis phase was completely single-threaded. And that was fine. Because at that point, we've already loaded everything we need for the analysis phase into memory. And it's a purely in-memory process. Um, and so even with a single thread, we were able to do that for even very large graphs, still very quickly. So. Um, you know, within 10 seconds. So, so let's, let's talk just briefly about some numbers. The typical analysis of a single rule takes about one millisecond. So if you have a thousand rules, you can do it in a second. If you have 10,000, you can do it in 10 seconds, right? And that's sufficient for small projects. Of course, as Google grew larger and you Google's monorepo grew larger, that wasn't feasible anymore. And so, of course, we started implementing multi-threaded analysis at that point. Um, and so that's also where the, the multi-threaded model for Starlight comes from. Now, the last phase is execution. And execution is, again, um, bound by the amount of hardware you have. And you really want to throw as much hardware as, it, as you can. Um, the larger you build, the more hardware you want to throw at it. Um, so, you know, again, let's talk about some simple examples. Typical C++ compiler takes about 10 to 100 milliseconds to run. Um, and on a quad-core laptop, you can run four of these in parallel. Um, and so, you know, if you have thousands and thousands of these actions, the more hardware, the more cores, the more threads you can do, the better. Um, ideally, you know, for very large builds, you want to use more than one machine. Um, that's where remote execution comes in. And in, in fact, Google had that back in 2009. Uh, this is not, not a new invention. Um, yeah, I, even a thousand actions in parallel, like, yeah, let's do it. The, the one tricky bit there is you want to make sure that your per action, the, like the local bookkeeping time for your, for your actions is less than the time that those actions take. Uh, <laughs> and, and unfortunately, you get some additional bookkeeping when you run things remotely. And so you want to make sure that that is as fast as possible. Not super important for rules authors, but maybe something to keep in mind. So, I said in the beginning, the, rules, the phase model is wrong. As far as the rules are concerned, it is accurate. Um, but it's not how Basil works. So Basil will make sure that, you know, from the point of view of your rules, this is what it looks like, right? First, the build file is loaded. Then, you know, some other things happen. Then your dependencies are analyzed, and then your code gets to run to analyze the current rule or perform whatever thing you need to do for your current rule. And only when that's done, the stuff that depends on your rule can start to evaluate. Um, the, the way Bazel works is that it can interleave these phases with each other. So it can 
read one build file uh, and then read a second build file and then start analyzing things in the first build file uh, and run those rule implementations while other things are still loading build files. And in principle, and when I left Google that wasn't implemented yet, um, you can even start executing actions at that point if you know which actions, actions need to be executed. This is something where rule authors need to be a little bit careful because when you create actions in your rule, these actions are not automatically executed. Um, but it depends on those providers. There is a default provider which says, these are the output files that should be generated if my rule is on the command line. And if you have actions that have output files that aren't in that depth set, then those may not get executed. I should really have a slide for that. Um, oh well. Hope that all makes sense. I see nodding. That's good. So let's get back to rules. So if you want to actually implement a rule, how do you do that? Um, this is focused on Starlark. There, you know, if you if you were to write a built-in rule, this would be different. However, if you if you send the Bazel team a pull request which adds a built-in rule to Bazel, they will say no. <laughs> right? They want all of the rules to be written in Starlark. There will even when the majority of rules is in Starlark, there will be a few rules that are still built into Bazel. Um, that is expected. Um, but pretty much all language-specific things should not be in Bazel proper, but should be Starlock rules. Uh, so how do Starlock rules work? Well, you write a BZL file, and you put code into that BZL file that declares the attributes of that rule, which I mentioned earlier, and also declares the implementation of that rule, which is a Starlock function that gets called in the analysis phase. So in the load, it doesn't get loaded it does not get called while loading the build file. It only gets called when the rule is analyzed, when the rule is evaluated. Uh, and that only happens when all the dependencies are evaluated. And at that point, that code, that function gets access to its dependencies, gets access to the providers. It can generate these output files, actions, can pass more information up. And that's it. There is nothing in Starlark that is evaluated, that is called at execution time. At execution time, only the actions are evaluated. And because you can't use Starlark today to write actions, the only thing you can do is call programs and other things that aren't written in Starlark today. So, so you're sitting there in your computer and you've Bazel, and you're wondering, should I write a new set of rules? The answer is probably not. Why not? There are already a lot of existing rules. There are rules for Android, for Boost, for C++, for Docker, Go, Haskell, Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, Kubernetes, maybe, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Right? I've provided two links here. If you're ever looking for a rule and you think it might already exist, this is the way to go. Uh, and check it out. Now, these rules are implemented by different people, different times, different companies, and it's not always the case that off-the-shelf rules will work for you, in which case you may have to change them or write your own or find some other way to make it work. Um, and part of the, the goal of these meetups is to make sure that we talk to each other and figure out how we can do that collaboratively. So let's look at a quick example. This is some Starlark code. It's like Python. Uh, when we declare a rule, uh, we call the rule function, which is built into Bazel, and we pass it a bunch of things. We pass it an implementation, uh, which must be a, a Starlark function of a specific, implemented in a specific way. And we'll have an example on the next page. Um, and then we have a few things about the rule, like is the output of the rule executable? Can you, can you do Bazel run on it? 
Um, and then we have attributes, and in this case, there is a single, simple single attribute called actual. Um, and this one is a label. This is not a string, so it, it declares a dependency. This dependency can be a single file. It's required to be executable. So Bazel will automatically give an error if you link if you if you reference a file that doesn't have the execute bit set um, or doesn't have the right extensions on Windows. Um, and there is a, another thing here, which is a transition. This is a configuration transition. It tr transitions to the execute um, configuration. So that's the rule declaration. This is the implementation. It's very simple. Um, it declares an output file. And this output file uses the extension .exe. This code here is platform independent, but we still use .exe in this rule because that is compatible with Windows, right? Linux doesn't care what the file extension is, so we can always use .exe. Windows cares, so there it works. And on Linux and Mac OS, it still works. Um, and then we symlink the, the input file to that, th so that we declare that output, but that output, we, when we generate it, it's actually a symlink. It, we don't actually copy it, we just symlink it. Um, again, there are some concerns about Windows here uh, that people might have. Uh, I <laughs> a few years ago, finally, they brought out a Windows version that allowed creating symlinks as a normal user, which is nice. Um, and we're happy to require that for our own code base, uh, as in, require a reasonably recent version of Windows for people who want to work on, on the Entrflow code base. This is actually from uh, Entrflow source code. And then we return a provider here. Here, this is a default provider. The default provider is specified by Bazel itself. Um, and it's used when this is, a, you know, when, when there is a standard, a standard dependency on this rule. Uh, so if you if you uh, build this from the command line, this is used. But also, um, if another rule depends on it, uh, and just wants files, right? A rule can say, "I just want files. I don't care, you know, what language or whatever else this 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 depends yet. I just want a file." Then it will also use this default provider. Uh, and in this case, it's an executable file, so this can be an input to say. A, a general where you use this as a tool to then run that locally and, and generate something. And so this looks a little bit weird. Why do we have this rule? Uh, what's the purpose of this rule? Um, and the purpose of this rule specifically is that we have cases where we have checked in binaries. So for example, we might have a checked in protocol compiler in our code base. I'm not confirming or denying whether we do have checked in protocol compiler, but imagine that we had, um, then we want the correct executable protocol compiler to be picked depending on the platform that we're running on, right? We have a Linux binary checked in, we have a Mac OS binary checked in, we have a uh, Windows binary checked in, maybe we even have an ARM Mac binary checked in. Um, and so we can use this rule and then in the actual attribute that's declared here, we can put in a select, and the select can look at the platform and then pick the correct file, right? And during the analysis phase, Bazel will look at that select function and evaluate it for us. And so when, this, when the code for this rule executes in the analysis phase, we get only that one file that matches the platform that we're on, and then we can just run that and rely on that. And then after that, it will always be the same name, right? So anything depending on this rule no longer has to worry about, you know, is there a version number in the, in the, in the tool like protocol compiler 4.5 or is there a, you know, specific extension on macOS or is there like Darwin in the name or anything like that? This all goes away at that point and it looks like a simple file. Any questions so far? Sorry, you can't read that yet. 
All right, I can go to the, oops, uh, that was too far. The declaration. That's an advanced topic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Bazel supports cross-platform and multi-platform builds. So you can run Bazel on Linux and produce a Windows binary, or the other way around. You can also run Bazel on macOS and produce multiple binaries for ARM and x86 and PowerPC, and then combine them into a single output file. Now, the actual usage of this concept is fairly involved, um, but the rules, as a rule author, you may have to dig into this a little bit to figure out what are the right transitions that I need to apply. Now, the, the good thing is Bazel supports all that. The problem is if you don't declare it correctly, then it won't work in a multi-platform context, which is to say it may work for you locally, but then you give it to your colleague and your colleague has a more complex setup, it doesn't work anymore. Or if you publish your rules for other people to use and they have more complex setups, that is also a problem. Was there something? No, okay. There was another question here. So the question is, um, if you have another provider or even multiple providers and you have other outputs that aren't in the default provider, is there a way to get Bazel to build those files even if no one depends on it? So apart from the default info provider, there is also a provider, and I can't remember the name right now. Output groups, yes, exactly. Thank you, Benjamin. There is the output groups provider. Um, and the way this works is that your rule can declare any number of output groups. It can group its outputs into multiple named groups. And then on the command line, there is a flag, a corresponding flag that allows you to say, oh, I want these other output groups as well. Any more questions? No questions. All right, we'll have a test in 15 minutes.